Bonjour Géraldine. Bonjour Jacques. We're delighted to welcome you today in the Louvre to explore women empowerment through the arts and especially the way a few women impacted their own time with the different means of what art can be. The Choose to Challenge theme of Women's International Day 2021 will take us behind the scenes of masterpieces. Female empowerment, diversity, parity, inclusion, the women of the Louvre have made their mark on history and ideas. Very few women artists are presented in the Louvre and for a very good reason. Back then, art was a man's business and women were not always free to express what they wanted to say. But actually what we're going to see is that some of them were able to tell their own story through the different means of art. The walls of the museum are graced with portraits of clairvoyant women of intellect, power, revenge or influence. Whether they were queens, princesses, mistresses or even commoners, those women invite us to discover the Louvre story. After all, Jacques, isn't the world's most famous painting a portrait of a woman? I think so. Let's go see. This is one of the most famous portraits in the world, and yet we still don't know everything about Mona Lisa. A few years ago, a historian has found new proof of evidence that she was Lisa Gerardini, the young wife of a Florentine merchant. And yet this portrait is now here at the Louvre. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the most brilliant geniuses of the Renaissance, instead of delivering this portrait to um, its commissioner, decided to take it over uh, in France, where he was to end his life at the court of the King of France. So many people have witnessed the creation and the genesis of this portrait and they commented about the incredible sense of life that uh, this portrait conceals. Can you realize that Leonardo has probably worked more than 15 years on uh, this portrait? So why uh, is that, uh, Jacques? Today it is the most famous painting in the world and the image that is the most immediately recognizable from a museum, it's not a portrait of Julius Caesar or of Napoleon, powerful man, is a woman who was, I would say, a bourgeois woman of her own time. And this, Leonardo must have recognized this. This is more than who she is. She is a global portrait. The portrait of mankind through the eyes of a man of the Renaissance. And this is why it's so fascinating today. This is why so many people come to the Louvre to see the portrait. It's because it's famous and it's because it rings a bell in a way in each of us because we can find ourselves in a way in this portrait. We are here in front of another icon of the Louvre, Joan of Arc. She played a prominent role uh, in the history of France during the 14th century. France was at war against uh, England and Jeanne d'Arc managed to fight next to Charles VII during this Hundred Years' War. And yet her existence itself has been very much debated. Some have said that maybe she was a man or maybe she was an illegitimate princess. She might be one of the most documented figures uh, in uh, history and especially for the Middle Age. This is the 1400s and this is a man's world. And here you have this 19 year old girl, this is the age she had when she died, who takes charge over a whole army. And this was intolerable for the people at that time. What was not possible was that she was using men's clothes. Of course, obviously, she was at the head of an army and she was as well fighting herself during the battle. So a dress and a woman clothes would have been very, very impractical. But this was used actually during her trial. So this image that she projected was something that was breaking a rule, basically, in the society of her own time. 
She was a bit forgotten uh, for some centuries and slowly but surely her figure was reactivated from the 19th century, even to the point uh, where uh, a lot of political parties and even the church claimed Joan of Arc as one of their uh, heroines. And even today, I have to say, uh, because of what you just said, Jack, about uh, this strong and powerful figure, uh, Joan of Arc can still be a heroine for uh, a lot of uh, people and groups and especially uh, committed uh, with uh, gender issues. So it's a brilliant example of self-empowerment. Uh, and it's as well a pure example of a recreation because we have to imagine that Joan of Arc was a name that was known for centuries, but her image was lost in time. What a difference of scale, Géraldine, between what we just saw and this incredible gallery, the largest in the Louvre, devoted to a queen of France, Marie de Médicis. In the painting that is here, she is being crowned in Saint-Denis on the 13th of May, 1610. And this is an interesting point of view because it's her husband, Henry IV, who was going to war and who wanted his wife to be able to reign while he was away. So this painting is depicting a moment that is incredibly rare in a way. It's when a woman, Queen of France, is empowered by her own husband. Maybe uh, we have to remember that in France, queens of France were not supposed to reign on their own. And so this is an incredible power for this woman who should never have been the Queen of France in the first place because she was born in Florence from a noble family and her life story made her arrive in this country. This is absolutely the point, Jack, is that we are here looking at the major episodes uh, in uh, Marie de Medici's life. And these episodes uh, compose a cycle that has been uh, very accurately um, conceived with her favorite painter. And he was not any painter. He was probably one of the most famous painters in Europe at that time. Uh, Rubens, working in Antwerp at the head of a major uh, studio uh, of uh, the Renaissance. So together, actually they really think about those episodes and how she wanted to be represented so we could speak of a true achievement of political communication here It's quite amazing with what happened with this second painting that I'm showing you here, is that on the 13th of May she was crowned and on the 14th of May, next day, her husband, Henry IV, was murdered. She had been crowned, so she became, legitimately, the real Queen of France. Actually, she was a regent because her son was too young. But this is exactly what the scene represents her. It is a woman who became a widow. This is why she's dressed in black, who is being um, on the throne. And you can see that all the ministers, and they're all men, of course, are coming to get their job from the new government that's going to be settled by the queen. So this is a very important political representation as well of the empowerment of a woman back in the early 17th century. Absolutely, and she uh, belonged to a very powerful uh, Italian family. She had these states for power, and actually even when her son grew up, she appeared to be quite reluctant to give up the power to her son. Isn't it weird that the France is uh, being represented with a nude breast on this historical painting? Well, for us, it can look a little bit weird and bizarre, actually, but here we're in the 17th century and showing the country France as an allegory, as a symbol like this, with a bare breast, of course, is quite common for the times. Uh, basically, here, France is a warrior because, I mean, there are wars everywhere, and she's represented a little bit like an Amazon in antiquity. But we will find this concept again in another painting, of course, that is even more famous than this one.
meeting one of the greatest icons of the Louvre. It is such a famous image here in France. I guess all French kids have seen this image in their uh, manuals of history at school. And even more, it used to be the face of the French Republic on former stamps and uh, banknotes. We are here in front of a painting that describes one of the many revolutions that uh, took place in France in the 19th century. What we have here basically is a representation of revolution and of France. The daring thing that the artist did, Delacroix, was use this image of a woman as a leader of the revolution. She is on the top of the barricade, she's the only woman in this image, and she does represent the dynamics of this political move that was the revolution of 1830. Usually, in traditional painting or art, you would have a man being in charge of a group of soldiers, of people of the revolution. But no, here he chose modernity and show a woman doing this. And this was quite new, actually. Sure, this was actually the very cause of the scandal that arose when Delacroix exhibited this painting. Actually, what shocked the public of the day was the very flesh of this body. Look at her red cheeks, the hair under the armpit. We are looking at a true woman from the people, those people who fought to conquer the liberty, the freedom for all. And this, of course, makes her an icon that is still valid today. There is another image that is quite similar to that, but of course the conditions are quite different, is the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York. So here we have two liberties basically that are being two very powerful women. Here we have this self-portrait of one extraordinary woman of her own time. This is Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun. She was, in her time, one of the first artists to make it as a portraitist and who was earning her money through her art. And this is very new at that time. She was, by the way, a good friend and the official portraitist of the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette herself. The painting that you see here where she is with her daughter is before the revolution. Geraldine, we're going to see another one when it comes during the revolution and the change of image is a little bit interesting. Yes, indeed, Jacques. This is a very modern painting, especially because it shows us uh, what we call today the female gaze. Elisabeth Vigée-Lebrun, such as the Queen Marie Antoinette, was following the ideas of the greatest philosophers of the day, such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote uh, many essays about new educational principles, where mothers were prompted to be closer uh, to their children. So here we see Julie embracing her mother. This is a tender and sweet image of private intimacy, and what would have been considered uh, a minor uh, subject was now now um, becoming a, a major theme that she exhibited at this uh, Salon of 1789. What a stunning painting this is. There will be so many things to be said about it. I have to confess that probably over time this has become one of my favorite paintings in the Louvre. First of all because this is a beautiful portrait but especially when you realize how difficult it has always been uh, to uh, render the color of a black skin on a painting. Painters throughout the centuries have experimented with a huge variety uh, of pigments, uh, bone char and here uh, when you look at this painting the subtlety of the shades and uh, the beautiful uh, softness of the skin makes it an amazing portrait. But I wonder, Jacques, do we have an idea of who this woman was? A few decades ago, she was known as Portrait of a Black Woman. But then, a few years ago, there was a big exhibition about black models in art, and research was done on the painting, and it was discovered that she had a name. Her name was Madeleine, and she was actually the um, servant of the brother-in-law of the painter. 
So this is the history of this painting that is coming alive, really. This is not only the portrait of any woman, but it was a freed slave that had come from Guadeloupe and that was living in Paris back in 1800, living a life as a servant. We haven't mentioned yet that the painter of this incredible portrait was also a woman. So what a, an incredible double act of self-empowerment and of a female gaze, a woman uh, artist uh, looking at and painting uh, a woman a sitter in this painting. And that Geraldine speaks to us very much today because this image of this woman, of course, represents much more than who she was. It became sensation a few years ago when the Carters did this video in the Louvre that was seen millions of times. And today, she is becoming an icon. 200 years after her creation as an image, Madeleine has become one of the most visited paintings in the Louvre. And this is incredibly moving. I think they would be very proud, her and the painter, if they had knew that. So we've seen so many beautiful works of art today in the museum. When you'll be able to come back to the museums, go, because you'll always be able to find your own icons. So we'll be glad to see you again, and thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you for being here with us on this tour today.